section thirty five of principles of geology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah principles of geology by charles lyle chapter sixteen part two mineral and thermal springs almost all springs even those which we consider the purest are impregnated with some foreign ingredients which being in a state of chemical solution are so intimately blended with the water as not to affect its clearness while they render it in general more agreeable to our taste and more nutritious than simple rain-water but the springs called mineral contain an unusual abundance of earthly matter in solution and the substances with which they are impregnated correspond remarkably with those evolved in a gaseous form by volcanoes many of these springs are thermal that is their temperature is above the mean temperature of the place and they rise up through all kinds of rock as for example through granite gneiss limestone or lava but are most frequent in volcanic regions or where violent earthquakes have occurred at eras comparatively modern the water given out by hot springs is generally more voluminous and less variable in quantity at different seasons than that proceeding from any others in many volcanic regions jets of steam called by the italians stufas issue from fissures at a temperature high above the boiling point as in the neighbourhood of naples and in the lapari isles and are disengaged unceasingly for ages now if such columns of steam which are often mixed with other gases should be condensed before reaching the surface by coming in contact with strata filled with cold water they may give rise to thermal and mineral springs of every degree of temperature it is indeed by this means only and not by hydrostatic pressure that we can account for the rise of such bodies of water from great depths nor can we hesitate to admit the adequacy of the cause if we suppose the expansion of the same elastic fluids to be sufficient to raise columns of lava to the lofty summits of volcanic mountains several gases the carbonic acid in particular are disengaged in a free state from the soil in many districts especially in the regions of active or extinct volcanoes and the same are found more or less intimately combined with the waters of all mineral springs both cold and thermal dr daubeny and other writers have remarked not only that these springs are most abundant in volcanic regions but that when remote from them their site usually coincides with the position of some great derangement in the strata a fault for example or great fissure indicating that a channel of communication has been opened with the interior of the earth at some former period of local convulsion it is also ascertained that at great heights in the pyrenees and himalaya mountains hot springs burst out from granitic rocks and they are abundant in the alps also these chains having all been disturbed and dislocated at times comparatively modern as can be shown by independent geological evidence the small area of volcanic regions may appear at first view to present an objection to these views but not so when we include earthquakes among the effects of igneous agency a large proportion of the land hitherto explored by geologists can be shown to have been rent or shaken by subterranean movements since the oldest tertiary strata were formed it will also be seen in the sequel that new springs have burst out and others have had the volume 
of their waters augmented and their temperature suddenly raised after earthquakes so that the description of these springs might almost with equal propriety have been given under the head of igneous causes as they are agents of a mixed nature being at once igneous and aqueous but how it will be asked can the regions of volcanic heat send forth such inexhaustible supplies of water the difficulty of solving this problem would in truth be insurmountable if we believed that all the atmospheric waters found their way into the basin of the ocean but in boring near the shore we often meet with streams of fresh water at the depth of several hundred feet below the sea level and these probably descend in many cases far beneath the bottom of the sea when not artificially intercepted in their course yet how much greater may be the quantity of salt water which sinks beneath the floor of the ocean through the porous strata of which it is often composed or through fissures rent in it by earthquakes after penetrating to a considerable depth this water may encounter a heat of sufficient intensity to convert it into vapour even under the high pressure to which it would then be subjected this heat would probably be nearest the surface in volcanic countries and farthest from it in those districts which have been longest free from eruptions or earthquakes it would follow from the views above explained that there must be a twofold circulation of terrestrial waters one caused by solar heat and the other by heat generated in the interior of our planet we know that the land would be unfit for vegetation if deprived of the waters raised into the atmosphere by the sun but it is also true that mineral springs are powerful instruments in rendering the surface subservient to the support of animal and vegetable life their heat is said to promote the development of the aquatic tribes in many parts of the ocean and the substances which they carry up from the bowels of the earth to the habitable surface are of a nature and in a form which adapts them peculiarly for the nutrition of animals and plants as these springs derive their chief importance to the geologist from the quantity and quality of the earthy materials which like volcanoes they convey from below upwards they may properly be considered in reference to the ingredients which they hold in solution these consist of a great variety of substances but chiefly salts with bases of lime magnesia alumin and iron combined with carbonic sulphuric and muriatic acids muriate of soda silica and free carbonic acid are frequently present also springs of petroleum or liquid bitumen and of naphtha calcareous springs our first attention is naturally directed to springs which are highly charged with calcareous matter for these produce a variety of phenomena of much interest in geology it is known that rainwater collecting carbonic acid from the atmosphere has the property of dissolving the calcareous rocks over which it flows and thus in the smallest ponds and rivulets matter is often supplied for the earthly secretions of testacea and for the growth of certain plants on which they feed but many springs hold so much carbonic acid in solution that they are enabled to dissolve a much larger quantity of calcareous matter than rainwater and when the acid is dissipated in the atmosphere the mineral ingredients are thrown down in the form of porous tuffa or of more compact travertin Auvergne. calcareous springs although most abundant in limestone districts are by no means confined to them but flow out indiscriminately from all rock formations 
in central france a district where the primary rocks are unusually destitute of limestone springs copiously charged with carbonate of lime rise up through the granite and gneiss nice. some of these are thermal and probably derive their origin from the deep source of volcanic heat once so active in that region one of these springs at the northern base of the hill upon which clermont is built issues from volcanic pepperino which rests on granite it has formed by its incrustations an elevated mound of travertin or white concretionary limestone two hundred forty feet in length and at its termination sixteen feet high and twelve wide another encrusting spring in the same department situated at chalusette near pont jabot rises in a nice country at the foot of a regular volcanic cone at least twenty miles from any calcareous rock some masses of tufaceous deposit produced by this spring have an oolitic texture valley of the elsa if we pass from the volcanic district of france to that which skirts the apennines in the italian peninsula we meet with innumerable springs which have precipitated so much calcareous matter that the whole ground in some parts of tuscany is coated over with tufa and travertin and sounds hollow beneath the foot in other places in the same country compact rocks are seen descending the slanting sides of hills very much in the manner of lava currents except that they are of a white color and terminate abruptly when they reach the course of a river these consist of a calcareous precipitate from springs some of which are still flowing while others have disappeared or changed their position such masses are frequent on the slope of the hills which bound the valley of the elsa one of the tributaries of the arno which flows near Kala, through a valley several hundred feet deep shaped out of a lacustrine formation containing fossil shells of existing species i observed here that the travertin was unconformable to the lacustrine beds its inclination according with the slope of the sides of the valley one of the finest examples which i saw was at the molino della caldane near cola the senna and several other small rivulets which feed the elsa have the property of encrusting wood and herbs with calcareous stone in the bed of the elsa itself aquatic plants such as carrier which absorb large quantities of carbonate of lime are very abundant baths of saint vignon those persons who have merely seen the action of petrifying waters in england will not easily form an adequate conception of the scale on which the same process is exhibited in those regions which lie nearer to the active centres of volcanic disturbance one of the most striking examples of the rapid precipitation of carbonate of lime from thermal waters occurs in the hill of san vignon in tuscany at a short distance from radicofani and only a few hundred yards from the high road between siena and rome the spring issues from near the summit of a rocky hill about one hundred feet in height the top of the hill stretches in a gently inclined platform to the foot of mount amiata a lofty eminence which consists in great part of volcanic products the fundamental rock from which the spring issues is a black slate with serpentine belonging to the older apennine formation the water is hot has a strong taste and when in not very small quantity is of a bright green color so rapid is the depositation near the source that in the bottom of a conduit pipe for carrying off the water to the baths and which is inclined at an angle of thirty degrees half a foot of solid travertin 
is formed every year a more compact rock is produced where the water flows slowly and the precipitation in winter when there is least evaporation is said to be more solid but less in quantity by one-fourth than in summer the rock is generally white some parts of it are compact and ring to the hammer others are cellular and with such cavities as are seen in the carious part of bone or the siliceous millstone of the paris basin a portion of it also below the village of san vignon consists of incrustations of long vegetable tubes and may be called tufa sometimes the travertine assumes precisely the botryoidal and mammillary forms common to similar deposits in auvergne of a much older date and like them it often scales off in thin slightly undulating layers a large mass of traverton descends the hill from the point where the spring issues and reaches to the distance of about half a mile east of san vignon the beds take the slope of the hill at about an angle of six degrees and the planes of stratification are perfectly parallel one stratum composed of many layers is of a compact nature and fifteen feet thick it serves as an excellent building stone and a mass of fifteen feet in length was in eighteen twenty eight cut out for the new bridge over the orsia another branch of it descends to the west for two hundred fifty feet in length of varying thickness but sometimes two hundred feet deep it is then cut off by the small river orsia as some glaciers in switzerland descend descend into a valley till their progress is suddenly arrested by a transverse stream of water the abrupt termination of the mass of rock at the river where its thickness is undiminished clearly shows that it would proceed much farther if not arrested by the stream over which it impends slightly but it cannot encroach upon the channel of the orsia being constantly undermined so that its solid fragments are seen strewed amongst the alluvial gravel however enormous therefore the mass of solid rock may appear which has been given out by this single spring we may feel assured that it is insignificant in volume when compared to that which has been carried to the sea since the time when it began to flow what may have been the length of that period of time we have no data for conjecturing in quarrying the traverton roman tiles have been sometimes found at the depth of five or six feet baths of san filippo on another hill not many miles from that last mentioned and also connected with mount amiata the summit of which is about three miles distant are the celebrated baths of san filippo the subjacent rocks consist of alternations of black slate limestone and serpentine there are three warm springs containing carbonate and sulphate of lime and sulphate of magnesia the water which supplies the baths falls into a pond where it has been known to deposit a solid mass thirty feet thick in about twenty years a manufactory of medallions in basso relievo is carried on at these baths the water is conducted by canals into several pits in which it deposits travertine and crystals of sulphate of lime after being thus freed from its grosser parts it is conveyed by a tube to the summit of a small chamber and made to fall through a space of ten or twelve feet the current is broken in its descent by numerous crossed sticks by which the spray is dispersed around upon certain moles which are rubbed lightly over with a solution of soap and a deposition of solid matter like marble is the result yielding a beautiful cast of the figures formed in the mould the geologist may derive from these experiments considerable light 
in regard to the high slope of the strata at which some semi-crystalline precipitations can be formed for some of the moulds are disposed almost perpendicularly yet the deposition is nearly equal in all parts a hard stratum of stone about a foot in thickness is obtained from the waters of san filippo in four months and as the springs are powerful and almost uniform in the quantity given out we are at no loss to comprehend the magnitude of the mass which descends the hill which is a mile and a quarter in length and the third of a mile in breadth in some places attaining a thickness of two hundred fifty feet at least to what length it might have reached it is impossible to conjecture as it is cut off like the traverton of san vignon by a small stream where it terminates abruptly the remainder of the matter held in solution is carried on probably to the sea spheroidal structure in traverton but what renders this recent limestone of peculiar interest to the geologist is the spheroidal form which it assumes analogous to that of the cascade of tivoli afterwards to be described the lamination of some of the concentric masses is so minute that sixty may be counted in the thickness of an inch yet notwithstanding these marks of gradual and successive deposition sections are sometimes exhibited of what might seem to be perfect spheres this tendency to a mammillary and globular structure arises from the facility with which the calcareous matter is precipitated in nearly equal quantities on all sides of any fragment of shell or wood or any inequality of the surface over which the mineral water flows the form of the nucleus being readily transmitted through any number of successive envelopes but these masses can never be perfect spheres although they often appear such when a transverse section is made in any line not in the direction of the point of attachment there are indeed occasionally seen small oolitic and pisolitic grains of which the form is globular for the nucleus having been for a time in motion in the water has received fresh accessions of matter on all sides in the same manner i have seen on the vertical walls of large steam boilers the heads of nails or rivets covered by a series of enveloping crusts of calcareous matter usually sulphate of lime so that a concretionary nodule is formed preserving a nearly globular shape when increased to a mass several inches in diameter in these as in many travertons there is often a combination of the concentric and radiated structure campagna de roma the country around rome like many parts of the tuscan states already referred to has been at some former period the site of numerous volcanic eruptions and the springs are still copiously impregnated with lime carbonic acid and sulphuretted hydrogen a hot spring was discovered about eighteen twenty seven near civita vecchia by signor riccioli which deposits alternate beds of a yellowish travertin and a white granular rock not distinguishable in hand specimens either in grain color or composition from statuary marble there is a passage between this and ordinary travertin the mass accumulated near the spring is in some places about six feet thick End of chapter sixteen part two chapter thirty six of principle of geology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Principle of Geology by Charles Leal. Weather species 
have a real existence in nature. Continued. Phenomena of hybrids. Hunter's opinions. Muse not strictly intermediate between parent species. Hybrid plants. Experiments of Kerreuter and Wigman. Vegetable hybrids prolific throughout several generations. Why rare in a wild state? De Candol on hybrid plants. The phenomena of hybrids confirm the distinctness of species. Theory of degradation in the intelligence of animals as indicated by the facial angle. Doctrine that certain organs of the fetus in mammalia assume successively the form of fish, reptile and bird. Recapitulation Phenomena of hybrids We have yet to consider another class of phenomena, those relating to the production of hybrids, which have been regarded in a very different light with reference to their bearing to the question of the permanent distinctness of species. Some naturalists considering them as affording the strongest of all proofs in favour of the reality of species, others, on the contrary, appealing to them as countenancing the opposite doctrine that all the varieties of organisation and instinct now exhibited in the animal and vegetable kingdoms may have been propagated from a small number of original types. In regard to the mammifers and birds, it is found that no sexual union will take place between races which are remote from each other in the habits and organization, and it is only in species that are very nearly allied that such unions produce offspring. It may be laid down as a general rule, admitting of very few exceptions among quadrupeds that the hybrid progeny is sterile and there seem to be no well-authenticated examples of the continuance of the new race beyond one generation. The principal number of observations and experiments relate to the mixed offsprings of the horse and the ass, and in this case it is well established that the he mule can generate and the she mule produce. Such cases occur in Spain and Italy, and much more frequently in the West Indies and New Holland. But these mules have never bred in cold climates, seldom in warm regions, and still more rarely in temperate countries. The hybrid offspring of the she-ass and the stallion, the Enosh of Aristotle and the Hinnos of Pliny, differs from the mule, or the offsprings of the ass and mare. In both cases, says Buffon, these animals retain more of the dam than of the sire, not only in the magnitude, but in the feature of the body, whereas in the form of the head, limbs and tail, they bear a greater resemblance to the sire. The same naturalist infers from various experiments respecting crossbreeds between the he-goat and the ewe, the dog and she-wolf, the goldfinch and canary bird, that the male transmits his sex to the greatest number, and that the preponderance of males over females exceeds that which prevails where the parents are of the same species. Hunter's Opinion The celebrated John Hunter has observed that the true distinction of species must ultimately be gathered from their incapacity of propagating with each other and producing offspring capable of again continuing itself. He was unwilling, however, to admit that the horse and the ass were of the same species, because some rare instances had been adduced of the breeding of mules, although he maintained that the wolf, the dog and the jackal were all of one species, because he had found, by two experiments, that the dog would breed both with the wolf and the jackal and that the mule, in each case, would breed again with the dog. In these cases, however, it may be observed that there was always one parent at least of pure breed, and no proof was obtained that the true hybrid race could be perpetuated, a fact of which, I believe, no examples are yet recorded, either in regard to mixtures of the horse and us, or any other of the mammalia.
should the fact be hereafter ascertained that two mules can propagate their kind we must still inquire whether the offspring may not be regarded in the light of a monstrous birth proceeding from some accidental cause or rather to speak more philosophically from some general law not yet understood but which may not be permitted permanently to interfere with those laws of generation by which species may in general be prevented from becoming blended if for example we discovered that the progeny of a new race degenerated greatly in the first generation in force sagacity or any attribute necessary for its preservation in a state of nature we might infer that like a monster it is a mere temporary and fortuitous variety nor does it seem probable that the greater number of such monsters could ever occur unless obtained by art for in hunter's experiments stratagem or force was in most instances employed to bring about the irregular connection mules not strictly intermediate between the parent species it seems rarely to happen that the mule offspring is truly intermediate in character between the two parents thus hunter mentions that in his experiments one of the hybrid poops resembled the wolf much more than the rest of the litter and we are informed by wigman that in a litter lately obtained in the royal menagerie at berlin from a white pointer and a she-wolf two of the cubs resembled the common wolf dog but the third was like a pointer with the hanging ears there is undoubtedly a very close analogy between these phenomena and those presented by the intermixture of distinct races of the same species both in the inferior animals and in men dr pritchard in his physical history of mankind cites examples where the peculiarities of the parents have been transmitted very unequally to the offspring as where children entirely white or perfectly black have sprung from the union of the european and the negro sometimes the color or other peculiarities of one parent after having failed to show themselves in the immediate progeny reappear in a subsequent generation as where a white child is born of two black parents the grandfather having been a white the same author judiciously observes that if different species mixed their breed and hybrid races were often propagated the animal world would soon present a scene of confusion its tribes would be everywhere blended together and we should perhaps find more hybrid creatures than genuine and uncorrupted races hybrid plants kilreuter's experiments the history of the vegetable kingdom has been thought to afford more decisive evidence in favour of the theory of the formation of new and permanent species from hybrid stocks the first accurate experiments in illustration of this curious subject appear to have been made by kolreuter who obtained a hybrid from two species of tobacco nicotiana rustica and nicotiana paniculata which differ greatly in the shape of their leaves the color of the corolla and the height of the stem the stigma of a plant of nicotiana rustica was impregnated with the pollen of a plant of nicotiana paniculata the seed ripened and produced a hybrid which was intermediate between the two parents and which like all the hybrids which this botanist brought up had imperfect stamens he afterwards impregnated this hybrid with the pollen of nicotiana paniculata and obtained plants which much more resembled the last this he continued through several generations until by due perseverance he actually changed the nicotiana rustica into the nicotiana paniculata the plan of impregnation adopted was the cutting off of the anthers of the plant intended for fructification before they had shed pollen 
and then laying on foreign pollen upon the stigma. Wickman's Experiments The same experiment has since been repeated with success by Wickman, who found that he could bring back the hybrids to the exact likeness of their parent, by crossing them a sufficient number of times. The blending of the characters of the parent stocks, in many other of Wickman's experiments, was complete. The color and shape of the leaves and flowers, and even the scent being intermediate, as in the offspring of the two species of verbascum, an intermarriage also between the common onion and the leek, allium cepa and allium porrum, gave a mule plant which, in the character of its leaves and flowers, approached most nearly to the garden onion, but had the elongated bulbous root and smell of the leek. The same botanist remarks that vegetable hybrids, when not strictly intermediate, more frequently approach the female than the male parent species, but they never exhibit characters foreign to both. A recross with one of the original stocks generally causes the mule plant to revert towards that stock, but it is not always the case, the offspring sometimes continuing to exhibit the character of a full hybrid. In general, the success attending the production and perpetuity of hybrids among plants depends, as in the animal kingdom, on the degree of proximity between the species and termariate. If their organization be very remote, impregnation never takes place. If somewhat less distant, seeds are formed, but always imperfect and sterile. The next degree of relationship yields hybrid seedlings, but these are barren. And it is only when the parent species are very nearly allied that the hybrid race may be perpetuated for several generations. Even in this case, the best authenticated examples seem confined to the crossing of hybrids with the individuals of pure breed. In none of the experiments most accurately detailed does it appear that both the parents were mules. Wigman diversified as much as possible his mode of bringing about these irregular unions among plants. He often saw with parallel rows near to each other of the species from which he desired to breed, and, instead of mutilating, after Correuter's fashion, the plants of one of the parent stocks, he merely washed the pollen off their anthers. The branches of the plants in each row were then gently bent towards each other and intertwined, so that the wind and numerous insects, as they passed from the flowers of one, to those of the other species, carried the pollen and produced fecundation. Vegetable hybrids were rare in a wild state. The same observer saw a good simplification of the manner in which hybrids may be formed in a state of nature. Some wallflowers and pinks had been growing in a garden, in a dry sunny situation, and their stigmas had been ripened so as to be moist and to absorb pollen with avidity, although their anthers were not yet developed. These stigmas became impregnated by pollen blown from some other adjacent plants of the same species, but had they been of different species, and not too remote in their organization, mill races must have resulted. When, indeed, we consider how busily some insects have been shown to be engaged in conveying anther dust from flower to flower, especially bees, flower-eating beetles, and the like, it seems a most enigmatical problem how it can happen that promiscuous alliances between distinct species are not perpetually occurring. How continually do we observe the bees diligently employed in collecting the red and yellow powder by which the stamens of flowers are covered loading it on their hind legs and carrying it to their hive for the purpose of feeding their young. In thus providing for their own progeny, these insects assist materially the process of fructification. Few persons need be reminded 
that the stamens in certain plants grow on different blossoms from the pistils and unless the summit of the pistil be touched with the fertilizing dust the fruit does not swell nor the seed arrive at maturity it is by the help of bees chiefly that the development of the fruit of many such species is secured the powder which they have collected from the stamens being unconsciously left by them in visiting the pistils how often during the heat of a summer's day do we see the maize of the issues plants such as the u3 standing separate from the females and sending off into the air upon the slightest breath of wind clouds of boyan pollen that the zephyr should so rarely intervene so fecundate the plants of one species with the anther dust of others seems almost to realize the converse of the miracle believed by the credulous herdsmen of the lusitanian mares ore omnes verse in zephyrum stant rupibus altis exceptanque leves auras et sepe sine ullis coniugis vento gravide mirabile dictu but in the first place it appears that there is a natural aversion in plant as well as in animals to regular sexual unions and in most of the successful experiments in the animal and vegetable world some violence has been used in order to procure impregnation the stigma imbibes slowly and reluctantly the granules of the pollen of another species even when it is abundantly covered with it and if it happened that during this period ever so slightly a quantity of the anther dust of its own species alight upon it this is instantly absorbed and the effect of the foreign pollen destroyed besides it does not often happen that the male and female organs of fructification in different species arrive at the state of maturity at precisely the same time even where such synchronism does prevail so that a cross impregnation is effected the chances are very numerous against the establishment of a hybrid race if we consider the vegetable kingdom generally it must be recollected that even of the seeds which are well ripened a great part are either eaten by insects birds and other animals or decay for want of room and opportunity to germinate unearthly plants are the first which are cut off by causes prejudicial to the species being usually stifled by more vigorous individuals of their own kind if therefore the relative fecundity or hardiness of hybrids be in the least degree inferior they cannot maintain their footing for many generations even if they were ever produced beyond one generation in a wise state in the universal struggle for existence the right of the strongest eventually prevails and the strength and durability of a race depend mainly on its prolificness in which hybrids are acknowledged to be deficient centaurea hybrida a plant which never bears seed and is supposed to be produced by the frequent intermixture of two well-known species of centaurea grows wild upon a hill near turin ranunculus lacerus also sterile has been produced accidentally at grenoble and near paris by the union of two ranunculi but this occurred in gardens mr herbert's experiments mr herbert in one of his ingenious papers on new plants endeavours to account for their non-occurrence in a state of nature from the circumstance that all the combinations that were likely to occur have already been made many centuries ago and have formed the various species of botanists but in our gardens he says whenever species having a certain degree of affinity to each other are transported from different countries and brought for the first time into contact they give rise to hybrid species but we have no data as yet to warrant the conclusion that a single permanent hybrid race has ever been formed even in gardens by the intermarriage of two allied species brought from distant habitations until some fact of this kind is fairly established and a new species 
capable of perpetuating itself in a state of perfect independence of man can be pointed out it seems reasonable to call in question entirely this hypothetical source of new species that varieties do sometimes spring up from cross breeds in a natural way can hardly be doubted but they probably die out even more rapidly than races propagated by graphs or layers opinion of de candol de candol whose opinion on a philosophical question of this kind deserves the greatest attention has observed in his essay on botanical geography that the varieties of plants range themselves under two general heads those produced by external circumstances and those formed by hybridity after adducing various arguments to show that neither of these causes can explain the permanent diversity of plants indigenous in the different regions he says in regard to the crossing of races i can perfectly comprehend without altogether sharing your opinion that where many species of the same genera occur near together hybrid species may be formed and i am aware that the great number of species of certain genera which are found in particular region may be explained in this manner but i am unable to conceive how any one can regard the same explanation as applicable to species which live naturally at great distances if the three larches for example now known in the world lived in the same localities i might then believe that one of them was the produce of the crossing of the two others but i never could admit that the siberian species has been produced by the crossing of those of europe and america i see then that there exist in organized beings permanent differences which cannot be referred to any one of the actual causes of variation and these differences are what constitutes species reality of species confirmed by the phenomena of hybrids the most decisive arguments perhaps amongst many others against the probability of the derivation of permanent species from cross breeds are to be drawn from the fact alluded to by de candol of species having a close affinity to each other occurring in distinct botanical provinces or countries inhabited by groups of distinct species of indigenous plants for in this case naturalists who are not prepared to go the whole length of the transmutationists are under the necessity of admitting that in some cases species which approach very near to each other in their characters were so created from their origin an admission fatal to the idea of its being a general law of nature that a few original types only should be formed and that all intermediate races should spring from the intermixture of those stocks this notion indeed is wholly at variance with all that we know of hybrid generation for the phenomenon entitled us to affirm that had the types been at first somewhat distinct no cross breeds would ever have been produced much less those prolific races which we now recognize as the instinct species in regard moreover to the permanent propagation of hybrid races among animals insuperable difficulties present themselves when we endeavour to conceive the blending together of the different instincts and properties of two species so as to ensure that preservation of the intermediate race the common mule when obtained by human art may be protected by the power of man but in a wild state it would not have precisely the same wants either as the oars or the ass and if in consequence of some difference of this kind it strayed from the herd it would soon be hunted down by beasts for prey and destroyed if we take some genus of insects such as the bee we find that each of the numerous species have some difference in its habits its mode of collecting honey or constructing its dwelling or providing for its young and other particulars in the case of the common hive bee the workers are described by kirby and spence 
as being endowed with no less than thirty distinct instincts. So, also, we find that amongst a most numerous class of spiders, there are nearly as many different modes of spinning their webs as there are species. When we recollect how complicated are the relations of these instincts with coexisting species, both of the animals and vegetable kingdoms, it is scarcely possible to imagine that the bastard race could spring from the union of two of these species, and retain just so much of the qualities of each parent stock as to preserve its ground in spite of the dangers which surround it. We might also ask if a few generic types alone have been created among insects, and the intermediate species have proceeded from hybridity. Where are those original types combining, as they ought to do, the elements of all the instincts which have made their appearance in the numerous derivative races. So, also in regard to animals of all classes and of plants, if species are in general of hybrid origin, where are the stocks which combine in themselves the habits, properties and organs of which all the intervening species ought to afford us mere modifications? Recapitulation of the arguments from hybrids I shall now conclude this subject by summing up, in a few words, the result to which I have been led by the consideration of the phenomena of hybrids. It appears that the aversion of individuals of the instinct species to the sexual union is common to animals and plants, and that it is only when the species approach near to each other in their organization and habits that any offspring are produced from their connection. Mews are of extremely rare occurrence in a state of nature, and no examples are yet known of their having procreated in a wild state. But it has been proved that hybrids are not universally sterile, provided the parent stocks have a near affinity to each other, although the continuation of the mixed race for several generations appears hitherto to have been obtained only by crossing the hybrids with individuals of pure species, an experiment which by no means bears out the hypothesis that a true hybrid race could ever be permanently established. Hence, we may infer that aversion to sexual intercourse is, in general, a good test of the distinctness of original stocks, or of a species, and the procreation of hybrids is a proof of the near affinity of species. Perhaps, Hereafter, the number of generations for which hybrids may be continued, before the race dies out, for it seems usually to generate rapidly, may afford the zoologist and botanist an experimental test of the difference in the degree of affinity of allied species. I may also remark that if it could have been shown that a single permanent species had ever been produced by hybridity, of which there is no satisfactory proof, it might certainly have lent some countenance to the notions of the ancients, respecting the gradual deterioration of created things, but none whatever to Lamarck's theory of their progressive perfectibility, for observations have hitherto shown that there is a tendency in mule animals and plants to degenerate in organization. It was before remarked that the theory of progressive development arose partly from an attempt to engraft the doctrines of the transmutationists upon one of the most popular generalizations in geology. But we have seen in the ninth chapter that the modern researches of geologists have broken at many points the chain of evidence once supposed to exist in favor of the doctrine that at each successive period in the earth history, animals and plants of a higher grade or more complex organization have been created. The recent origin of man and the absence of all signs of any rational being holding an analogous relation to former states of the animate world affords one, and perhaps in the present state of science, the only argument of much weight in support of the hypothesis of a progressive scheme, but none whatever in favour of the fancied evolution of one species out of another. 
theory of the gradation of intellects as shown by the facial angle when the celebrated anatomist kemper first attempted to estimate the degrees of sagacity of different animals and of the races of men by the measurement of the facial angle some speculators were bold enough to affirm that certain simie or apes differed as little from the more savage races of men as those do from the human race in general and that a scale might be traced from apes with foreheads villanus low to the african variety of the human species and from that to the european the facial angle was measured by drawing a line from the prominent centre of the forehead to the most advanced part of the lower jawbone and observing the angle which it made with the horizontal line and it was affirmed that there was a regular series of such angles from birds to the mammalia the gradation from the dog to the monkey was said to be perfect and from that again to man one of the ape tribe has a facial angle of forty two degrees and another which approximated nearest to men in figure an angle of fifty degrees to this succeeds longo sed proximus intervallo the head of the african negro which as well as that of the kalmuk forms an angle of seventy degrees while that of the european contains eighty degrees the roman painters preferred the angle of ninety five degrees and the character of beauty and sublimity so striking in some works of grecian sculpture as in the head of the apollo and in the medusa of sisocles is given by an angle which amounts to one hundred degrees a great number of valuable facts and curious analogies in comparative anatomy were brought to light during the investigations which were made by camper john hunter and others to illustrate the scale of organization and their facts and generalizations must not be confounded with the fanciful systems which white and others deduce from them that there is some connection between an elevated and capacious forehead in certain races of men and the large development of the intellectual faculties seems highly probable and that a low facial angle is frequently accompanied with inferiority of mental powers is certain but the attempt to trace a gradual scale of intelligence through the different species of animals accompanying the modifications of the form of the skull is a mere visionary speculation it has been found necessary to exaggerate the sagacity of the ape tribe at the expense of the dog and strange contradictions have arisen in the conclusions deduced from the structure of the elephant some anatomists being disposed to deny the quadruped the intelligence which he really possesses because they found that the volume of his brain was small in comparison to that of the other mammalia while others were inclined to magnify extravagantly the superiority of his intellect because the vertical height of his skull is so great when compared to its horizontal length different races of men are all of one species it would be irrelevant to our subject if we were to enter into a further discussion on these topics because even if a graduated scale of organization and intelligence could have been established it would prove nothing in favor of a tendency in each species to attain a higher state of perfection i may refer the reader to the writings of blumenbach pritchard lawrence and more recently latham for convincing proofs that the variety of form color and organization of different races of men are perfectly consistent with the generally received opinion that all the individuals of the species have originated from a single pair and while they exhibit in man as many diversities of a physiological nature as appear in any other species they confirm also the opinion of the slight deviation from a common standard of which species are capable the power of existing and multiplying in every latitude and in every variety of situation and climate 
which has enabled the great human family to extend itself over the habitable globe is partly says lawrence the result of physical constitution and partly of the mental prerogative of man if he did not possess the most enduring and flexible corporeal frame his arts would not enable him to be the inhabitant of the old climates and to brave the extremes of heat and cold and the other destructive influences of local situation yet notwithstanding the flexibility of bodily frame we find no signs of indefinite departure from a common standard and the intermarriages of individuals of the most remote varieties are not less fruitful than between those of the same tribe Tiedman on the brain of the fetus invertebrated animals there is yet another department of anatomical discovery to which i must allude because it has appeared to some persons to afford a distant analogy at least to that progressive development by which some of the inferior species may have been gradually perfected into those of more complex organization Tiedman found and his discoveries have been most fully confirmed and elucidated by Serre, that the brain of the fetus in the highest class of vertebrated animals assumes in succession forms bearing a certain degree of resemblance to those which belong to fishes reptiles and birds before it acquires the additions and modifications which are peculiar to the mammiferous tribe so that in the passage from the embryo to the perfect mammifer there is a typical representation it is said of all those transformations which the primitive species are supposed to have undergone during a long series of generations between the present period and the remotest geological era if you examine the brain of the mammalia says Serre, at an early stage of uterine life you perceive the cerebral hemispheres consolidated as in fish in two vesicles isolated one from the other at a later period you see them affect the configuration of the cerebral hemispheres of reptiles still later again they present you with the forms of those of birds finally they acquire at the era of birth and sometimes later the permanent forms which the adult mammalia present the cerebral hemispheres then arrive at the state which we observe in the higher animals only by a series of successive metamorphoses if we reduce the whole of these evolutions to four periods we shall see that the first are born the cerebral lobes of the fishes and this takes place homogeneously in all classes the second period will give us the organization of reptiles the third the brain of birds and the fourth the complex hemispheres of mammalia if we could develop the different parts of the brain in the inferior classes we should make in succession a reptile out of a fish a bird out of a reptile and a mammiferous quadruped out of a bird if on the contrary we could starve this organ in the mammalia we might reduce it successively to the condition of the brain of the three inferior classes nature often presents us with this last phenomenon in monsters but never exhibits the first among the various deformities which organized beings may experience they never pass the limits of their own classes to put on the forms of the class above them never does a fish elevate itself so as to assume the form of the brain of a reptile nor does the latter even attain that of birds nor the bird that of the mammifer it may happen that a monster may have two heads but the conformation of the brain always remains circumscribed narrowly within the limits of its class dr clark of cambridge in a memoir on fatal development eighteen forty five has shown that the current labors of valentin ratke and bischoff disprove the reality of the supposed anatomical analogy between the embryo condition of certain organs in the higher orders and the perfect structure of the same organs in animals of an inferior class the hearts and brains for example of birds and mammals do not pass through forms which are permanent in fishes and reptiles 
there is only just so much resemblance as may point to a unity of plan running through the organization of the whole series of vertebrate animals, but which lends no support whatever to the notion of a gradual transportation of one species into another, least of all of the passage, in the course of many generations, from an animal of a more simple to one of a more complex structure. Recapitulation For the reasons, therefore, detailed in this and the two preceding chapters, we may draw the following inferences in regard to the reality of species in nature. First, that there is a capability in all species to accommodate themselves, to a certain extent, to a change of external circumstances, this extent varying greatly according to the species. Secondly, when the change of situation which they can endure is great, it is usually attended by some modifications of the form color, sites, structure, or other particulars, but the mutations thus superinducted are governed by constant laws, and the capability of sovereign forms part of the permanent specific character. Thirdly, some acquired peculiarities of form, structure, and instinct are transmissible to the offspring, but this consists of such qualities and attributes only as are intimately related to the natural wants and propensities of the species. Fourthly, the entire variation from the original type which any given kind of change can produce may usually be affected in a brief period of time, after which no further deviation can be obtained by continuing to alter the circumstances, though ever so gradually. Indefinite divergence either in the way of improvement or deterioration, being prevented, and the least possible excess beyond the defined limits being fatal to the existence of the individual. Fifthly, the intermixture of distinct species is guarded against by the aversion of the individuals composing them to sexual union, or by the sterility of the new offspring. It does not appear that true hybrid races have ever been perpetuated for several generations, even by the assistance of men, for the cases usually cited relate to the crossing of mules with individuals of pure species, and not to the intermixture of hybrid with hybrid. Sixthly, from the above considerations, it appears that species have a real existence in nature, and that each was endowed, at the time of its creation, with the attributes and organization by which it is now distinguished. End of chapter 36 Recording by Emanuela Chapter 17, Part 1 of Principle of Geology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Principle of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 17, Part 1. Reproductive Effects of Rivers. Lake Deltas. Growth of the delta of the Upper Rhine in the Lake of Geneva. Computation of the age of deltas. Recent deposits in Lake Superior. Deltas of Island Seas. Course of the Po. Artificial embankments of the Po and Edige. Delta of the Po and other rivers entering the Adriatic. Rapid conversion of that gulf into land. Mineral characters of the new deposits, marine delta of the Rhone, various proof of its increase, stony nature of its deposits, coast of Asia Minor, delta of the Nile. Deltas in lakes I have already spoken in the 14th chapter of the action of running water and of the denuding power of rivers, 
but we can only form a just conception of the excavating and removing force exerted by such bodies of water when we have the advantage of examining the reproductive effects of the same agents in other words of beholding in a palpable form the aggregate amount of matter which they have thrown down at certain points in the alluvial plains or in the basin of lakes and seas yet it will appear when we consider the action of currents that the growth of delta affords a very inadequate standard by which to measure the entire carrying power of running water since a considerable portion of fluviatile sediment is swept far out to sea deltas may be divided into first those which are formed in lakes secondly those in island seas where the tides are almost imperceptible and thirdly those on the borders of the ocean the most characteristic distinction between the lacustrine and marine deltas consists in the nature of the organic remains which become embedded in their deposits for in the case of a lake it is obvious that this must consist exclusively of such genera of animals as inhabits the land or the waters of a river or a lake whereas in the other case there will be an admixture and most frequently a predominance of animals which inhabit salt water in regard however to the distribution of inorganic matter the deposits of lakes and seas are formed under very analogous circumstances lake of geneva lakes exemplify the first reproductive operations in which rivers are engaged when they convey the detritus of rocks and the egrandets of mineral springs from mountainous regions the accession of new land at the mouth of the rhone at the upper end of the lake of geneva or the Lehman lake presents us with an example of a considerable thickness of strata which have accumulated since the historical era this sheet of water is about thirty seven miles long and its breadth is from two to eight miles the shape of the bottom is very regular the depth having been found by late measurement to vary from twenty to one hundred and sixty fathoms the rhone where it enters at the upper end is turbid and discolored but its waters where it issues at the town of geneva are beautifully clear and transparent an ancient town called port Ballet, portus valesie of the romans once situated at the water's edge at the upper end is now more than a mile and a half inland this intervening alluvial tract having been acquired in about eight centuries the remainder of the delta consists of a flat alluvial plain about five or six miles in length composed of sand and mud a little raised above the level of the river and full of marshes Sirari de la beach found after numerous soundings in all parts of the lake that there was a pretty uniform depth of from one hundred twenty to one hundred sixty fathoms throughout the central region and on approaching the delta the shallowing of the bottom began to be very sensible at a distance of about a mile and three quarters from the mouth of the rhone from a line drawn from st gingulf to vevey gives a mean depth of somewhat less than six hundred feet and from that part of the rhone the fluviatile mud is always found along the bottom we may state therefore that the new strata annually produced are thrown down upon a slope about two miles in length so that notwithstanding the great depth of the lake the new deposits are inclined at so slight an angle that the deep of the beds would be termed in ordinary geological language horizontal the strata probably consists of alternation of finer and coarser particles for during the hotter months from april to august when the snows melt the volume and velocity of the river are greatest and large quantities of sand mud vegetable matter and driftwood are introduced but during the rest of the year the influx is comparatively feeble so much so that the whole lake according to saussure stands six feet lower 
if, then, we could obtain a section of the accumulation formed in the last eight centuries, we should see a great series of strata, probably from 600 to 900 feet thick, the supposed original depth of the head of the lake, and nearly two miles in length, inclined at a very slight angle. In the meantime, a great number of small deltas are growing around the borders of the lake, at the mouths of rapid torrent, which pour in large masses of sand and pebbles. The body of water in this torrent is too small to enable them to spread out the transported matter over so extensive an area as the road does. Thus, for example, there is a depth of eighty fathoms within half a mile of the shore, immediately opposite the great torrent which enters east of Ripo, so that the deep of the strata is that minor delta must be about four times as great as those deposited by the main river at the upper extremity of the lake. Chronological computations of the age of deltas. The capacity of this basin being now ascertained, it would be an interesting subject of inquiry to determine in what number of years the Liman Lake will be converted into a dry land. It would not be very difficult to obtain the elements for such a calculation, so as to approximate at least to the quantity of time required for the accomplishment to the result. The number of cubic feet of water annually discharged by the river into the lake being estimated, experiments might be made in the winter and summer months, to determine the proportion of matter held in suspension or in chemical solution by the Rhone. It would be also necessary to allow for the heavier matter dripped along at the bottom, which might be estimated on hydrostatical principle, when the average size of the gravel and the volume and velocity of the stream at different seasons were known. Supposing all these observations to have been made, it would be more easy to calculate the future than the former progress of the delta, because it would be a laborious task to ascertain, with any degree of precision, the original depth and extent of that part of the lake which is already filled up. Even if this information were actually obtained by borings, it would only enable us to approximate within a certain number of centuries to the time when the Rhone began to form its present delta. But it would not give us the date of the origin of the Liman Lake in its present form, because the river may have flowed into it for thousands of years without importing any sediment whatever. Such would have been the case if the waters had first passed through a chain of upper lakes, and that this was actually the fact, seems indicated by the course of the Rhone between Martigny and the Lake of Geneva, and still more decidedly by the channels of many of its principal feeders. If we ascend, for example, the valley through which the Drance flows, we find that it consists of a succession of basins, one above the other, in each of which there is a wide expanse of flat alluvial lands, separated from the next basin by a rocky gorge, once perhaps the barrier of a lake. The river seems to have filled these lakes, one after the other, and to have partially cut through the barriers, some of which it is still gradually eroding to a greater depth. Before, therefore, we can pretend even to hazard the conjecture as to the era at which the principal delta of Lake Liman or any other delta commenced, we must be throughout acquainted with geographical features and geological history of the whole system of higher valleys which communicate with the main stream. And all the changes which they have undergone since the last series of convulsions which agitated and altered the face of the country. Lake Superior Lake Superior is the largest body of fresh water in the world, being above 1,700 geographical miles in circumference when we follow the sinuosities of its coasts, and its length, on a curved line drawn through its centre, being more than 400 and an extreme breadth above 150 geographical miles. Its surface is nearly as large as the whole of England. Its average depth varies from 80 to 150 fathoms. But according to Captain Bayfield, 
there is a reason to think that its greatest depth would not be overrated at two hundred fathoms, so that its bottom is, in some parts, nearly six hundred feet below the level of the Atlantic, its surface being about as much above it. There are appearances in different parts of this, as of the other Canadian lakes, leading us to infer that its water formerly occupied a higher level than they reached at the present, for at a considerable distance from the present shores, parallel lines of rolled stones and shells are seen rising one above the other, like the seats of an amphitheater. These ancient lines of shingle are exactly similar to the present beaches in most bays, and they often attain an elevation of forty or fifty feet above the present level. As the heaviest gales of wind do not raise the waters more than three or four feet, the elevated beaches have, by some, been referred to the subsidence of the lake at former periods, in consequence of the wearing down of its barrier by others to the upraising of the shores by earthquakes, like those which have produced similar phenomena on the coast of Chile. The streams which discharge their waters into Lake Superior are several hundred in number, without reckoning those of smaller size, and the quantity of water supplied by them is many times greater than that discharged at the falls of St. Mary, the only outlet. The evaporation, therefore, is very great, and such as might be expected from so vast an extent of surface. On the northern side, which is encircled by primary mountains, the rivers sweep in many large boulders with smaller gravel and sand, chiefly composed of granitic and trap rocks. There are also currents in the lake in various directions, caused by the continued prevalence of strong winds, and to their influence we may attribute the diffusion of finer mud far and wide over great areas, for, by numerous soundings made during Captain Bayfield's survey, it was ascertained that the bottom consists generally of a very adhesive clay, containing shells of the species at present existing in the lake. When exposed to the air, this clay immediately becomes indurated in so great a degree as to require a smart blow to break it. It effervesces slightly with diluted nitric acid, and is of different colors in different parts of the lake. In one district blue, in another red, and in a third white, hardening into a substance resembling pipe clay. From these statements, the geologist will not fail to remark how closely these recent lacustrine formations in America resemble the tertiary argileus and calcareous mars of lacustrine origin in central France. In both cases, Many of the genera of shells most abundant, as Linnea and Planorbis, are the same, and in regard to other classes of organic remains, there must be the closest analogy, as I shall endeavour more fully to explain when speaking of the embedding of plants and animals in recent deposits. Deltas of Inland Seas Having thus briefly considered some of the clacustrine deltas now in progress, we may next turn our attention to those of inland seas. Course of the Po The Po affords an instructive example of the manner in which a great river bears down to the sea the matter poured into it by a multitude of tributaries descending from lofty chains of mountains. The change is gradually effected in the great plain of northern Italy since the time of the Roman Republic are considerable. Extensive lakes and marshes have been gradually filled up, as doors near Placentia, Parma and Cremona, and many have been drained naturally by the deepening of the beds of rivers. Deserted river courses are not unfrequent, as that of the Serio Morto, which formerly fell into the Adda in Lombardy. The Po also itself has often deviated from its course, having after the year 1390, deserted part of the territory of Cremona and invaded that of Parma, its sole channel being still recognizable and bearing the name of Po Morto. There is also an old channel of the Po in the territory of Parma called Po Vecchio, 
which was abandoned in the twelfth century when a great number of towns were destroyed artificial embankments of italian rivers to check these and similar aberrations a general system of embankment has been adopted and the po adige and almost all their tributaries are now confined between high artificial banks the increased velocity acquired by stream thus closed in enabled them to convey a much larger portion of foreign matter to the sea and consequently the deltas of the po and adige have gained far more rapidly on the adriatic since the practice of embankment became almost universal but although more sediment is borne to the sea part of the sand and mud which in the natural state of things would be spread out by annual inundations over the plain now subsides in the bottom of the river channels and their capacity being thereby diminished it is necessary in order to prevent inundation in the following spring to extract the matter from the bed and to add it to the banks of the river hence it happens that these streams now traverse the plain on the top of high mounds like the waters of aqueducts and at ferrara the surface of the po has become more elevated than the roofs of the houses the magnitude of these barriers is a subject of increasing expense and anxiety it having been sometimes found necessary to give an additional height of nearly one foot to the banks of the adige and po in a single season the practice of embankment was adopted in some of the italian rivers as early as the thirteenth century and dante writing in the beginning of the fourteenth describes in the seventh circle of hell a rivulet of tears separated from a burning sanding desert by embankments like those which between ghent and bruges were raised against the ocean or those which the paduans has erected along the brenta to defend their villas on the melting of the alpine snows. Quali fiamminghi tra guzzante e luggia, temendo il fiotto che in ver lor s'avventa, fanno lo schermo, perché il mar si fuggia, e quali padovan lungo la brenta, per difender lor ville e lor castelli, anzi che carentano il caldo senta. Inferno, canto quindicesimo in the adriatic from the northern part of the gulf of trieste where this one so enters down to the south of ravenna there is an uninterrupted series of recent accessions of land more than one hundred miles in length which within the last two thousand years have increased from two to twenty miles in breadth a line of sandbars of great length has been formed nearly all along the western coast of this gulf inside of which are lagoons such as those of venice and the large lagoon of Comacchio, twenty miles in diameter. Newly deposited mud, brought down by the streams, is continually lessening the depth of the lagoons, and converting part of them into meadows. The Isonzo, Tagliamento, Piave, Brenta, Adige and Po, beside many other inferior rivers, contribute to this advantage of the coastline, and to the shallowing of the lagoons and the gulf. Delta of the Po The Po and the Adige may now be considered as entering by one common delta, for two branches of the Adige are connected with arms of the Po, and thus the principal delta has been pushed out beyond those bars which separate the lagoons from the sea. The rate of the advance of this new land has been accelerated, as before stated, since the system of embarking the rivers became general, especially at that point where the Po and Adige enter. The waters are no longer permitted to spread themselves far and wide over the plains and to leave behind them the larger portion of their sediment mountain torrents also have become more turbid since the clearing away of the forests which once clothed the southern flanks of the alps it is calculated that the mean rate of advance of the delta of the po on the adriatic between the years twelve hundred and sixteen hundred was twenty-five yards or meters a year whereas the mean annual gain from sixteen hundred to eighteen o four was seventy meters adria was a seaport in the time of augustus and had in ancient times given its name to the gulf 
it is now about twenty Italian miles in land. Ravenna was also a seaport, and is now about four miles from the main sea. Yet, even before the practice of embankment was introduced, the alluvium of the Po advanced with rapidity on the Adriatic, for Spina, a very ancient city, originally built in the district of Ravenna at the mouth of the great arm of the Po, was, so early as the commencement of our era, eleven miles distant from the sea. But, although so many rivers are rapidly converting the Adriatic into land, it appears, by the observation of M. Morlaw, that since the time of the Romans, there has been a general subsidence of the coast and bed of the sea in the same region to the amount of five feet, so that the advance of the new-made land has not been so fast as it would have been had the level of the coast remained unaltered. The signs of a much greater depression anterior to the historical period have also been brought to light by an Arthesian well, bored in 1847 to the depth of more than 400 feet, which still failed to penetrate through the modern fluviatic deposit. The ogre passed chiefly through beds of sand and clay, but at four several depths, one of them very near the bottom of the excavation, had pierced beds of turf or accumulations of vegetable matter, precisely similar to those now formed superficially on the extreme borders of the Adriatic. Hence, we learn that a considerable area of what was once land has sunk down 400 feet in the course of ages. The greatest depth of the Adriatic between Dalmatia and the mouth of the Po is 22 fathoms, but a large part of the Gulf of Trieste and the Adriatic, opposite Venice, is less than 12 fathoms deep. Farther to the south, where it is less affected by the influx of great rivers, the Gulf deepens considerably. Donati, after dredging the bottom, discovered the new deposits to consist partly of mud and partly of rock, the rock being formed of calcareous matter and crusting shells. He also ascertained that particular species of testacea were grouped together in certain places and were becoming slowly incorporated with the mud or calcareous precipitates. Olivi also found some deposits of sand and others of mud extending halfway across the gulf, and he states that their distribution along the bottom was evidently determined by the prevailing current. It is probable, therefore, that the final sediment of all the rivers at the head of the Adriatic may be intermingled by the influence of the current, and all the central parts of the gulf may be considered as slowly filling up with horizontal deposits, similar to those of the Subapennine hills and containing many of the same species of shells. The Po merely introduced at present fine sand and mud, for it carries no pebbles farther than the spot where it joins the Trebia, west of Piacenza. Near the northern borders of the basin, the Isonzo, Tagliamento and many other streams are forming immense beds of sand and some conglomerates, for here some high mountains of alpine limestone approach within a few miles of the sea. In the time of the Romans, the hot baths of Monfalcone were on one of several islands of alpine limestone, between which and the mainland, on the north, was a channel of the sea, about a mile broad. This channel is now converted into a grassy plain, which surrounds the islands on all sides. Among the numerous changes on this coast, we find that the present channel of the Isonzo is several miles to the west of its ancient bed, in part of which, at Ronchi, the old Roman bridge which crossed the Via Appia was lately found buried in fluviatile silt. End of chapter 17, part 1 Recording by Emanuela Chapter 17, Part 2 of Principle of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
www.ecofinancepodcast.org Recording by Emanuela Principle of Geology by Charles Leal Marine Delta of the Rhone The lacustrine delta of the Rhone in Switzerland has already been considered. Its contemporaneous marine delta may not be described. Scarcely has the river passed out of the lake of Geneva before its pure waters are again filled with sand and sediment by the impetuous arve, descending from the highest Alps and bearing along in its current the granitic detritus annually brought down by the glaciers of Mont Blanc. The Rhone afterwards received a vast contribution of transported matter from the Alps of Dauphiny and the primary and volcanic mountains of central France, and when at length it entered the Mediterranean, it discolors the blue waters of that sea with a whitish sediment, for the distance of between six and seven miles, throughout which space the current of fresh water is perceptible. Strabo's description of the delta is so inapplicable to its present configuration as to attest a complete alteration in the physical features of the country since the Augustan age. It appears, however, that the head of the delta, or the point at which it begins to ramify, has remained unaltered since the time of Pliny, for he states that the Rhone divided itself at all into two arms. This is the case at present. One of the branches, the western, being now called the Ption, which is again subdivided before entering the Mediterranean, the advance of the base of the delta in the last 18 centuries is demonstrated by many curious antiquarian monuments. The most striking of these is the great and unnatural detour of the old Roman road from Ugernum to Bézier, Beterre, which went round by name Nemausus. It is clear that, when this was first constructed, it was impossible to pass in a direct line, as now, across the delta, and that either the sea or marshes intervening in a track now consisting of terra firma. Astro also remarks that all the places on low lands lying to the north of the old Roman road between Nîmes and Bézier have names of Celtic origin, evidently given to them by the first inhabitants of the country, whereas the places lying south of that road toward the sea have names of Latin derivation, and were clearly founded after the Roman language had been introduced. Another proof, also, of the great extent of land which has come into existence since the Romans conquered and colonized Gaul is derived from the fact that the Roman writers never mentioned the thermal waters of Baruch in the delta, although they were well acquainted with those of Aix, and others are still more distant, and attached great importance to them as they invariably did to all hot springs. The waters of Balaruk, therefore, must have formerly issued under the sea, a common phenomenon on the borders of the Mediterranean, and, on the advance of the delta, they continued to flow out through the new deposits. Among the more direct proofs of the increase of land, we find the Mies, described under the appellation of Mesuacollis by Pomponius Mela, and stated by him to be nearly an island, is now far inland. Notre-Dame-de-Port, also, was a harbour in 898, but is now a league from the shore. Psalmody was an island in 815, and is now two leagues from the sea. Several old lines of towers and sea marks occur at different distances from the present coast, all indicating the successive retrieves of the sea for each line has in its turn become useless to mariners, which may be well conceived when we state that the Tower of Tignon, erected on the shore so late as the year 1737, is already a mile remote from it. By the confluence of the Rhone and the currents of the Mediterranean, driven by winds from the south, sandbars are often formed across the mouths of the river. By these means, considerable spaces become divided off from the sea, and subsequently from the river also, when it shifts its channels of efflux. As some of these lagoons are subject to the occasional ingress of the river when flooded, and of the sea during storms, they are alternately 
salt and fresh. Others, after being filled with salt water, are often lowered by evaporation till they become more salt than the sea. And it has happened, occasionally, that a considerable precipitate of muriate of soda has taken place in these natural sultans. During the latter part of Napoleon's career, when the excise laws were enforced with extreme rigour, the police was employed to prevent such salt from being used. The fluviatil and marine shells enclosed in these small lakes often live together in brackish water, but the uncongenial nature of the fluid usually produces a dwarfish size and sometimes gives rise to strange varieties in form and color. Captain Smith, in his survey of the coast of the Mediterranean, found the sea opposite the mouth of the Rhone to deepen gradually from four to forty fathoms, within a distance of six or seven miles, over which the discolored fresh water extends, so that the inclination of the new deposits must be too slight to be appreciable in such an extent of section as a geologist usually obtains in examining ancient formations. When the wind blew from the southwest, the ships employed in the survey were obliged to quit their moorings, and when they returned, the new sand banks in the delta were found covered over with a great abundance of marine shells. By this means, we learn how occasional beds of drifting marine shells may become interstratified with the fresh water strata at the river's mouth. Stony nature of its deposits. That a great proportion, at least, of the new deposit in the delta of the Rhone consists of rock, and not of losing current matter, is perfectly ascertained. In the museum at Montpellier is a cannon taken up from the sea near the mouth of the river, embedded in a crystalline calcareous rock. Large masses, also, are continually taken up of an arenaceous rock, cemented by calcareous matter, including multitudes of broken shells of recent species. The observation lately made on this subject corroborate the former statement of Marsili that the earthy deposit of the coast of Languedoc form a stony substance, for which reason he ascribes a certain bituminous saline and glutinous nature to the substances brought down with sand by the Rhone. If the number of mineral springs charged with carbonate of lime which fall into the Rhone and its feeders in different parts of France be considered, we shall feel no surprise at the lapidification of the newly deposited sediment in this delta. It should be remembered that the fresh water introduced by rivers being lighter than the water of the sea floats over the latter, and remains upon the surface of, for a considerable distance. Consequently, it is exposed to as much evaporation as the waters of a lake, and the area over which the river water is spread, at the junction of great rivers and the sea, may well be compared, in point of extent, to that of considerable lakes. Now, it is well known that so great is the quantity of water covered off by evaporation in some lakes that it is nearly equal to the water flowing in, and in some inland seas, as the Caspian, it is quite equal. We may, therefore, well suppose that, in cases where a strong current does not interfere, the greater portion not only of the matter held mechanically in suspension, but of that also which is in chemical solution, may be precipitated at no great distance from the shore. When these finer ingredients are extremely small in quantity, they may only suffice to supply crustaceous animals, corals and marine plants, with the earthy particles necessary for their secretions. But whenever it is in excess, as generally happens if the basin of a river lie partly in a district of active or extinct volcanoes, then will solid deposit be formed, and the shells will at once be included in a rocky mass. Coast of Asia Minor Examples of the advance of the land upon the sea are afforded by the southern coast of Asia Minor. Admiral Sir F. Beaufort 
has pointed out in his survey the great alterations affected since the time of Strabo, where heavens are filled up, islands join the mainland, and where the whole continent has increased many miles in extent. Strabo himself, on comparing the outline of the coast in his time with its ancient state, was convinced, like our countrymen, that it had gained very considerably upon the sea. The new formed strata of Asia Minor consist of stone, not of loose incoherent materials. Almost all the streamlets and rivers, like many of those in Tuscany and the south of Italy, hold abundance of carbonate of lime in solution, and precipitate travertine, or sometimes bind together the sand and gravel into solid sandstones and conglomerates. Every delta and sandbar does acquires solidity, which often prevents streams from forcing their way through them, so that their mouths are constantly changing their position. Delta of the Nile That Egypt was the gift of the Nile was the opinion of her priest before the time of Herodotus, and Rennell observes that the configuration and composition of the lowlands leave no room for doubt that the sea once washed the base of the rocks on which the pyramids of Memphis stand, the present base of which is washed by the inundation of the Nile at an elevation of seventy or eighty feet above the Mediterranean. But when we attempt to carry back our ideas to the remote period when the foundation of the delta was first laid, we are lost in the contemplation of so vast an interval of time. Herodotus observes that the country round Memphis seemed formerly to have been an arm of the sea gradually filled by the Nile, in the same manner as the Mende, Echelos, and other streams had formed deltas. Egypt, therefore, he says, like the Red Sea, was once a long narrow bay, and both gulfs were separated by a small neck of land. If the Nile, he adds, should by any means have an issue into the Arabian Gulf, it might choke it up with earth in twenty thousand or even perhaps in ten thousand years, and why may not the Nile have filled a still greater gulf with mud in the space of time which has passed before our age? The distance between Memphis and the most prominent part of the delta in a straight line north and south is about one hundred geographical miles. The length of the base of the delta is more than two hundred miles if we follow the coast between the ancient extreme eastern and western arms. But as these are now blocked up, the part only of lower Egypt, which intervenes between the Rosetta and the Mietta branches, is usually called the delta, the coastline of which is about ninety miles in length. The bed of the river itself, says Sir J. G. Wilkinson, undergoes a gradual increase of elevation varying in different places, and always lessening in proportion as the river approaches the sea. This increase of elevation in perpendicular height is much smaller in lower than in upper Egypt, and in the delta it diminishes still more, so that, according to an approximate calculation, the land about Elephantine, or the first cataract, latitude 24 degrees 5, has been raised 9 feet in 1,700 years. At Thebes, latitude 25 degrees 43, about 7 feet, and at Heliopolis and Cairo, latitude 30 degrees, about 5 feet 10 inches. At Rosetta and the mouth of the Nile, latitude 31 degrees 30, the diminution in the perpendicular thickness of the deposit is lessened in a much greater decreasing ratio than in the straightened valley of central and upper Egypt, owing to the great extent east and west, over which the inundation spreads. For this reason, the alluvial deposit does not cause the delta to protrude rapidly into the sea, although some ancient cities are now a mile or more inland, and the mouth of the Nile mentioned by the early geographers, have been many of them silted up, and the outline of the coast entirely changed. 
the bed of the Nile always keeps pace with the general elevation of the soil, and the banks of this river, like those of the Mississippi and its tributaries, are much higher than the flat land at a distance, so that they are seldom covered during the highest inundations. In consequence of the gradual rise of the river's bed, the annual flood is constantly spreading over a wider area, and the alluvial soil encroaches on the desert, covering, to the depth of six or seven feet, the base of statues and temples which the waters never reached three thousand years ago. Although the sands of the Libyan deserts have in some places been drifted into the valley of the Nile, yet these aggressions, says Wilkinson, are far more than counterbalanced by the fertilizing effect of the water which now reaches far running lands toward the desert, so that the number of square miles of arable soil is greater at present than at any previous period. Mud of the Nile On comparing the different analyses which have been published of this mud, it will be found that it contains a large quantity of argillaceous matter, with much peroxide of iron, some carbonate of lime, and a small proportion of carbonate of magnesia. The latest and most careful analysis by M. Lassen shows a singularly close resemblance in the proportions of the ingredients of silica, alumina, iron, carbon, lime, and magnesia, and those observed in ordinary mica. But a much larger quantity of calcareous matter is sometimes present. In many places, as at Cairo, where artificial excavations have been made, or where the river has undermined its banks, the mud is seen to be thinly stratified, the upper part of each annual layer consisting of earth of a lighter color than the lower, and the whole separating easily from the deposit of the succeeding year. These annual layers are variable in thickness, but, according to the calculations, of Girard and Wilkinson, the mean annual thickness of a layer at Cairo cannot exceed that of a sheet of thin pasteboard, and a stratum of two or three feet must represent the accumulation of a thousand years. The depth of the Mediterranean is about twelve fathoms at a small distance from the shore of the delta. It afterwards increases gradually to fifty, and then suddenly descends to 380 fathoms, which is, perhaps, the original depth of the sea where it has not been rendered shallower by fluviatile matter. We learn from Eutina Newbold that nothing but the finest and lightest ingredients reach the Mediterranean, where he has observed the sea discolored by them to the distance of 40 miles from the shore. The small progress of the delta in the last 2,000 years affords, perhaps, no measure for estimating its rate of growth when it was an inland bay, and had not yet protruded itself beyond the coastline of the Mediterranean. A powerful current now sweeps along the shores of Africa, from the Straits of Gibraltar to the prominent convexity of Egypt, the western side of which is continually the prey of the waves, so that not only are fresh accessions of land checked, but ancient parts of the delta are carried away. By this cause, Canopus and some other towns have been overwhelmed, but to this subject I shall again refer when speaking of tides and currents. End of chapter 17, part 2 Recording by Emanuela